Cougs House. The Houston Cougars are headed to the Big 12 title game. Let's talk about how we got there and what's coming next for the Cougs. You are Locked On Cougs, your daily podcast on the Houston Cougars, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome to Locked On Cougs, daily podcast about your Houston Cougars, bringing you a bonus episode on your Houston Cougars this weekend, as it is championship weekend here for the Houston Cougars. I'm your host, Parker Ainsworth. Remember, we're doing a giveaway every 500 subscribers on YouTube. We're at just about 2,100. The next one of those is obviously at 2,500. Like, subscribe, and comment to let us know you're in that contest when we get there. If you don't know what to say about the basketball program after a big win over Texas Tech last night, tell us in the comments down below what your favorite brand of tortilla chip is. I'm a Julio's fan. That might be controversial. I think they're fairly mainstream at this point. That's probably kind of lame of me. But tell us what you like. It is championship week. We're talking chips all week in the questions. Now, today we've got a couple of things to talk about. I'm going to go quickly because, as you can tell, I'm still in a roads of basement, still doing family time. I had to wait till this morning when things were – oh, people were awake and things were still relatively quiet. But we got to talk some about getting through Texas Tech. And what that looks like, we're going to talk some about Iowa State and the rubber match that is the championship game later on this evening. And then last but not least, I want to take a moment to talk about winning 30 basketball games. Again, getting to be in the norm here in Houston, but I want to make sure we talk about, honestly, I want to make sure we talk about how unreal that is. Now, today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. America's number one sports book, but there'll be more on that later. In the game against Texas Tech, if you do not get to watch the game, if you are out doing spring break things or living under a rock or we just want to relive it. Houston pushed through to win 82 to 59 led by LJ Cryer's 20 points, six to 15 shootings, all six of those from behind the arc. Uh, Emmanuel Sharp joined him in the scorebook with 17, four of eight from behind the arc himself. Jamal Shade had 12, which is diminutive compared to his 29, the first time to play Texas tech. But as I told you, his whole game plan was going to still be to dish the ball out. He got his 10 assists to those two shooters. I told you going into the game <laughs> that the only way to stop Jamal Shedd if you were Tech was going to be to help off of guys. That opened up a lot of three-point jump shots. Houston themselves was 42.9% from behind the arc. Malik Wilson also tallied one. Jamal Shedd hit one himself. Um, everyone except for Sedlot and Javier Francis, every guard that sets in the game shot at three, all had good looks at them. Uh, Elvin's got blocked. That's not even over there. Um, the real thing in this game, though, was that J1 Roberts suffered a shin contusion early in the first half. He would play a little bit on in the first half, get some treatment, and come back out to start the second half. Obviously, the big deal there is what is his long-term health for the already battered Cougars. Um, all indications of the post-game where this is the kind of thing that may be sore that he is going to play through does not sound like any super long-term effects. The issue is just that like, we're kind of at the precipice of all of this mattering, right? The championship game for Houston is Saturday night. March madness starts next weekend and he'll obviously be needed in that first round game. You think you're getting a 16 seed, but as you saw last year, uh, sometimes those 16 seeds are a little tricky to deal with at the gate after taking a few days off. And so we're trying to make sure he gets healthy by then. As of the recording of this podcast, it is still unclear exactly what he'll be looking like on Saturday night. Uh, he is going to try to play that much is for sure. Uh, just how much and how effective is to be questioned. Um, obviously, as a spiritual leader and a, like a, a guy that's like a culture guy out there, uh, we want him out there as much as possible. Malik Wilson said as much when he was talking to Chris Baldwin in Paper City Magazine, said that um, – He's the like culture fit on the floor. And then frankly, everyone tries to pick up the slack once he gets off because there's just so much ground to cover without him on the floor. Uh, I will say that I felt like in his absence in the second half, J.B. or Francis probably played his best half of basketball in uh, the entire season thus far. J.B. or Francis ended up finishing with 12 points and three blocks and two steals, nine rebounds. I mean, he was all over the floor. But I, I thought his defense along the perimeter, which is not quantifiable necessarily, was as impressive as any of that. Uh, he's a great switch defender, and it's really hard to find in a center. He's playing at the level of the screen, so when a guard would come off the screen, he plays up at the same level as the guard and didn't have to play sunk back and, like, you know, use his length or whatever. But then there were multiple times where he'd retreat back from 
playing at the level and they'd switch back and he would get back to the rim to protect the rim before the ball got there. And I think that's hard to quantify, but impre- incredibly impressive uh, and incredibly important to the win last night, honestly. Now, Houston won by, I'm not great at math, but 23 points, right? They're up by closer to 30 at various points in the game. But honestly, it was in doubt at one point early in the second half. Um, early in the second half, Jamal Shedd, about a minute into the second half, committed a turnover on a post-entry pass to Roberts. Uh, and then the next possession down, fouled a jump shooter. Uh, and then he gets subbed out at the 1859 mark. After the free throw, Houston was only up by one point, 35 to 34. Uh, two minutes later, after sitting for a couple minutes, Jamal Shedd came back in, had regathered himself, had gotten chewed out by Coach Sampson, a little bit by Kwanis as well, right? Comes back in, Houston's only up three, four to 37, had actually been tied at 37 for what it's worth. Houston would proceed to go on a 22 to six run upon the eight minutes that Jamal Shedd came back in the game. The first eight minutes Jamal Shedd came back in the game, Houston outscored Texas Tech 22 to six. Now, part of that was that Cryer and Sharp both found their rhythm um, it was impressive to see the big men, both Francis and said, and a little bit of Jay Wong was in there could roll and occupy in the middle on a pick and roll play with Jamal shed. Um, he would look to them, the defense collapse, he'd kick it. You'd find crier and sharp on different kind of movement things. Those guys hit a bunch of open threes. Houston was on fire shooting in the second half. And it felt like that kind of shooting performance was due out of the Cougars that have not had that frankly, in a couple weeks at this point. And so it was good to see those guys come out and shoot the ball that well. Uh, hope that continues to like spark a great shooting march. Frankly, it's looking like a deep run here in the tournament because we're going to need those jump shots. I can tell you right now, confidently, that when those two guys, Cryer and Sharp, combined to go 10 of 19 from behind the arc, more than 50, per- well over 50%, no one's beating Houston. Now, that won't happen very often. That was exceptionally powerful, great shooting, right? But if someone on Houston is shooting, or if this combination of those two guys are shooting 10 of 19, high volume, high percentage from behind the arc, no one's beating this team. There's no way to cover them, right? Because you either have to let Shed go off pick and roll with just his man coming off the screen and he's like a, a half a step late. You have to give it up to Francis at the rim, give it up to J1 at the rim, give it up to Set at the rim, or you give up the three. You have to give something up. Every defense has to concede something. It's what are you willing to give up and how are you willing to react to what you gave up there. Um, if they're giving up those threes and we're shooting like that, there's not a whole lot they can do. In the first segment, I said I want to talk about tech, and we're almost out of the first segment. I do want to talk a little bit about, in this game, Malik Wilson's continued impressive athleticism. He played 32 minutes, largely because he made up for a lot of the minutes that uh, J1 Roberts missed play the power forward spot. I've talked about it before um, that he plays a small ball four and it's going to morph into that role uh, as guys have gotten hurt this season. But I want to stress that he is six to a buck 75, right? This is your like smallest of small ball fours in a lot of ways. And I don't think people realize that when he gets nine points and six rebounds because of his length, athleticism, and frankly, grit, determination, all those culture words, It is not a given that he can do that, right? Yes, he can fly. Yes, he is athletic. Yes, he can be super quick. But he is also playing a glorified power forward spot at six foot two. And I I know he's got big men behind him. If he misses a block, do we get the rebound or whatever? But that's impressive, right? And Malik Wilson continues to do these kinds of things. I know that there was a moment, those two minutes I was talking about where Jamal Shea got subbed out, actually. He kind of did some of the initiation, the point guard kind of stuff. There aren't a whole lot of players in any level of basketball in America that can go back and forth like that, go from the point guard, backup point guard spot to power forward spot, back and forth, back and forth. Like it's like prime Jay- Draymond Green, right? Like how many guys are we really talking about here? Um, impressive performance out of him. Damian Dunn getting back on track some too. He was four or six from the field, um, had a couple great like – pump fake, two dribble pull up kind of stuff. And he actually got to spots where he was open on the two dribbles. The criticism at this point has been like he's dribbling into traffic with those. He managed to find spots before where he was open. Um, really, really impressive game out of him. Those two guys coming into form in March and finding these important roles to fill in March is so, so key for this team because A, they kind of are the bench right now, but also B, 
it's adding a layer to this team where like, okay, we have this crazy athletic guy that comes and plays power forward. What you're going to do eight seed. Okay. We got this guy that's just a straight bucket getter and Damian Dunn went off the bench that he's going to ISO with some, he's going to go two pound pull up. Somebody's going to raise up above the defense. Some we're going to do about it. Five seed. Like they're going to be ready for these kinds of moments in March. If those guys continue to step up and I want to make sure we don't gloss over, like those guys are kind of growing up before our very own eyes. Now, I do want to talk some about Iowa State and previewing that game some. But first, we got to talk some about our buddies that are taking us on adventures just like the adventure one right now. And that's our buddies at NissanUSA.com because right now there are all kinds of great options out there. They're comparing the Nissan Armada somewhat to the Houston Cougars, right? Uh, Challenge your expectations. You think of this group of five team coming into the Power Five and it's like, what are they going to do? Oh, they're going to perform. That's the Armada does as well. Picture that rugged, tough four by four, but still seats up to eight different people in a first class luxury style, bigger toe, uh, all kinds of things that kind of defy your expectations. That's what this Houston Cougar team is. And that's what the Nissan Armada brings as well. Take the Nissan Rogue, Pathfinder, or Armada today and go figure out your next big adventure shop, NissanUSA.com. All right, I want to talk some about our newest buddies over at Robin Hood as well. Did you know that even if you have a 401k for retirement, you still have an IRA? Robin Hood has the only IRA that gives you a 3% boost on every dollar you contribute when you subscribe to Robin Hood Gold. But get this, now through April 30th, Robin Hood is even boosting every single dollar you transfer from the other retirement accounts on a 3% match. That's right, no cap on the 3% match. Robin Hood Gold gets you the most for your retirement thanks to IRA with 3% match. This offer is good through April 30th. Get Robinhood, uh, get started at Robinhood.com slash boost. Subscription fees apply. And now for some legal info, claim of Q1 2024 validated by Radius Global Market Research. Investing involves include uh, investing involves included risk and, and risk of loss. Limitations apply to IRA and 401ks. 3% match requires Robinhood Gold for one year from the day that the first 3% match must keep Robinhood IRA for five years. 3% match on transfers subject to specific terms and conditions. Robinhood IRA is available to U.S. customers in good standing. Robinhood Financial LLC, a member SIPC, is a registered broker dealer. All right, so Iowa State. I want to stress that Iowa State is the matchup I wanted. I was on the record after Houston played Iowa State in mid-February about a, almost a month ago at this point, that honestly, I would have loved if the Big 12 championship was just a seven-game series between Houston and Iowa State. These are two teams that look like the Spider-Man meme going back and forth at one another. Houston is 23-3. and three. Iowa State is 20-6. and six. This is a matchup for the Big 12 championship that is, frankly, as ugly, dirty, gritty as it gets. And then both teams met up in mid-February. Houston was number two in the country. Iowa State was number six. Presently, Iowa State's number seven, Houston's number one. So, like, those have only shifted slightly. This is a very similar kind of feeling. Iowa State beat Houston by four at their place. Houston beat Iowa State by eight in Houston, right? Like, these teams are very, very evenly matched. Uh, and they play a playing style that, frankly, feels very similar. Now, in the matchup that Houston won, the most recent matchup, Jamal Shad was kind of on a tear. It was that point of the season where he was kind of the defining factor. He, he kind of earned his... Big 12 player of the year award in the stretch of Big 12 play, kind of the latter two thirds of it. In this game, he finished with 26 points, six rebounds, four assists, three steals, um, two steals in the second half, 20 points and five, uh, sorry, 20 points, five assists, and two steals in the second half alone. Got to the free throw line a lot, forced Iowa State to make decisions. Those decisions led to fouls, those fouls led to free throws. Um, in the first, um, Five minutes, second half. It was a close game at halftime. Jamal Shea came out at halftime and had one of those like stretches where he's like, I'm winning this basketball game, dang it. And he stretched out in that first five minutes with three points of his own and three assists, covered the entire offensive production in that stretch. Um, he was able to put the big guy, Rob Jones, from them in a blender. Um, he was attacking gaps on the zone, kind of broke Iowa State's ability to zone and made them change up what they were doing um, on offense. It's also kind of the first game we saw Malik Wilson playing at, well at this extended, at, for an extended period at the stretch four spot. Um, he was aggressive. He was athletic. He, he was doing all the kind of things we know that Malik does now. This is the front end, the first Iowa, the second Iowa State game was kind of the front end of him figuring out that role. 
Um, you saw Emmanuel attack the rim some. We did see a JoJo Tugler attempt from three. That's not, not going to happen this time around, but, eh, you know. Um, I think it's interesting to see that I think Iowa State's the best team to play all year, to play them twice. But I also think that it was kind of the moment in the, like nationally, when I was like, okay, if Houston can beat Iowa State, they can beat anyone, right? Because we knew the Kansas thing happened mostly because it was at Kansas, and we knew that Iowa State was, you know, a team that was really good, but that Houston ended up ultimately being able to knock out. And so as I look at this matchup, when I think of the way that probably zone again uh, to try and see, frankly, they're going to bank on to start the game, I imagine. Can Houston repeat the shooting performance on tired legs on Saturday that they had on Friday. Houston's guys have played a lot of minutes, right? Not a whole lot of depth in the bench played. This is the third game in three days. Um, Iowa state, for instance, went four, went uh, four off their bench four like true bench guys against um, Houston. The first time around two of them just played a combined 10 minutes, but those guys were not playing like garbage time minutes. Those were actual minutes in the end of the basketball game. Uh, against Baylor on uh, Friday night, I was about to say Saturday, Baylor on Friday night, uh, Iowa State also went into their bench, played three guys, uh, all like contributing real minutes, actual minutes in this basketball game. Um, I'd imagine what you're looking at here is can they zone Houston, make Houston shoot threes and tired legs and win a shooting contest because they ex- expect their legs to be a little bit less tired, right? Um, Fort Worth, they had a good shooting night themselves against Baylor. They shot 50% from behind the arc and a 10 20 as a team. Got to pay attention uh, to the sharp shooter that is Curtis Jones, 6'4 guard. Uh, he went, um, <coughs> excuse me, sorry, he went three to six behind the arc. And uh, the Moximil- Moxim- Mo- the Moximil- Momsilovich, Momsilovich, let's say I actually pronounce it. I need to stop mispronouncing his name. Momsilovich, six foot eight freshman. He hit three of six from behind the arc as well. Remember, he's the guy who had to turn around the baseline to beat Houston time in Iowa State. He continues to be a matchup problem. I imagine Emmanuel Sharp gets that matchup and does the same kind of aggressive attack go at him kind of stuff that he did in, in the second matchup. It kind of got him off of his rocker a little bit, kind of rocked his world. The matchup that the rest of America wants to see in this game, though, will be Tam and Lipsy against Jamal Shedd, a point guard on point guard. Leader on leader. Now, Lipsy's just a sophomore, and I guess Shed is a senior with a COVID year of eligibility left if he wanted it. Um, but honestly, what's going to happen here is those two guys are going to defend each other whenever they're in man. Houston's going to be man the most of the game, I would imagine, because the Iowa State size, and they're going to be attacking, attacking, attacking. These guys are both downhill threats with decent outside jump shots. I mean, say that you can't play the three on them, but attacking the rim, attacking the rim, attacking the rim put pressure on the defense. Um, when they go zone, the key will be who on Houston attacks the gaps besides Jamal Shedd. Because we know Jamal will, and we know that starts the offense. But if only one player is attacking the gaps, unless they're having a crazy good night scoring like Jamal did the first time, which is possible, right? If they're on their own and not having a 25-plus point performance, the defense can kind of sit still. And the whole point of the zone defense is to frankly, rest your legs for offense, but also to be big, cut off easy shots, make you shoot hard ones, right? So Emmanuel Sharp's going to need to attack the gaps. Malik Wilson's going to need to attack the gaps. Uh, frankly, if J1 Roberts is really 100% or however close he is, attacking those interior gaps post-to-post passing, like we saw him do against Baylor zone earlier in the season, um, that kind of stuff at John would be huge. Um, frankly, if they're going to run a true zone, I do think this is the kind of game that you could see uh, a lot more said a lot. Uh, Rob Jones is a 6'10", big, strong kid himself. I don't think he's got the 270 pounds that uh, Malik, that uh, that said has, but he'll play a lot of minutes in this game. And that's a cover that I think said can do. And so I think what you'll see is, while well, Francis's ability to kind of shift the perimeter and bump back, like I talked about in the first segment is valuable. I don't think Seth's going to get out-athleted by Rob Jones either from Iowa State. So anticipate seeing him a lot as well. Um, honestly, this is going to be a full team, especially if Jay Wan's out. This is a full team effort. Um, not that he's out, but if he's not 100%, he's going to try and play. So if he's not 100%, it's probably the better way to say that, right? Um, I imagine, I actually think on the neutral floor, Houston has a shot to, to win the Big Gold Championship here. Um, I say on a neutral floor because there is a lot of Iowa State 
maroon and yellow or whatever you want, burgundy and yellow, whatever you want to call that color on every time you turn on the TV in this tournament. Um, they are very, very present in Kansas City in a way that like it is a neutral floor, but it it might feel like it's not at times in this game. Um, obviously, Houston won in Houston, Iowa State won in Iowa. So they're going to feel like they should earn a number one seed in the tournament if they win this game. Um, I I wouldn't be opposed to the Big 12 getting two number one seeds. I think Houston's kind of showed why they deserve it at this point. Um, now, what I will say is, is that uh, all this is to say that the home court advantage can throw off shooting, can increase defense, et cetera, et cetera. And if Iowa State's got that, uh, this could be a tough one for Houston, but I still think Houston gets it out. I'm thinking like a six point win. I'm thinking it's like three or four. And then you start playing the free throw game where they foul and come down and school, blah, blah, blah. Right. And so that's kind of why I think it gets to be a six point game. Um, but I'm thinking it gets to be Houston's way down the stretch. Um, and it's a tough one. Like this is as tough a matchup because it's such a mirrored matchup of Houston as there is. Now I did say in the final segment, I want to talk some about, Winning 30 games some of the time because after beating Texas Tech, Houston officially has 30 wins on the season. But first, I want to talk a little bit about where I'm watching these games. That is Amazon Fire because Fire TV is your destination for sports, live games, highlights, in-depth analysis, and more. Fire TV offers amazing experiences with smart TVs as well as a Fire Stick TV. It's Fire TV Stick that you can plug in your existing TV and provide a million of movies. TV episodes, as well as free and live TV. Whether it's opening weekend for baseball or college basketball tournament, you're going to want to have Fire TV on. Trust me, March Madness starts this week. Get it through Amazon right now. Fire TV recently created Fire TV channels to deliver constant supply of the latest videos from your favorite sports brands all for free. And yes, that includes us here at Locked On and most of the pro sports leagues and college conferences as well. Fire TV channels let you dive deep into all the game analysis, highlights, and more. Keep up the latest in the world of sports, whether it's March Madness, the NBA, MLB, or more. Uh, not to mention all kinds of great news, entertainment, gaming, travel, and cooking videos as well. Check out Fire TV channels on Fire TV and Alexa devices. If you haven't checked out Fire TV channels, you should. Trust me, listen to learn more. Visit Amazon.com slash Fire TV. Last but not least of our buddies here, let's talk some about our friends at FanDuel because it is March Madness and you can say goodbye to busted brackets this March Madness because FanDuel lets you bet on every game of the tourney, whether you're betting on a big upset or a one seed, it's time to go dancing on America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets if your first $5 bet wins. So you put $5 down and Houston to be the 16 seed. They do it. And you get 200 bucks back in bonus bets. You can use that on point spreads or money lines. You can even pick who's going to win it all like the Cougs. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on bet on any college hoops until they cut down the Nets. FanDuel is a sportsbook partner of the NBA. All right. Um, I want to talk some briefly about this 30-win Houston Cougar team. We've got to tweet this out after it happened, but beating Texas Tech was officially the 30th win on the season for Kelvin Sampson and the Cougs. And I think once they entered the conference tournament with 28 wins, we kind of thought that 30 was coming, right? Um, you know, whether it came from one in the conference tournament and one in the NCAA tournament or whatever, the 30 was coming. And I think it's kind of become a thing of – normalcy in Houston to win 30 games the third season in a row that Houston has found a way to win 30 games but for this particular season I want to stress that Houston lost two starters of last year's team to the NBA draft one of them was a top 10 pick in Jairus Walker Marcus Sasser was a first round pick as well Houston lost a third starter a guy who bluntly won them an NCAA tournament game last year and Tremont Mark and a transfer to Arkansas now, I'm not one to wish ill on anyone, but that really was a punch to the gut for Houston is what are they going to do now? How are they going to place those points? And Houston hit the transfer for themselves. I mean, make light of the addition of LJ Cryer or Damian Dunn. But the whole point was to be adding guys to what was already here. And you lost three starters off of last year's team that spent a chunk of the year ranked as the number one team in the country. Houston also spent this season joining the Big 12 Conference, moving up from the Power Five to a high-dollar, high-level basketball conference, not just any Power Five conference, the number one conference by every analytical metric in America for several years in a row now. I'm talking the conference that had a 
runner up in the 2019 March Madness tournament, had the 2021 winner, had the team ranked number one in the country when the conference, when the NCAA tournament didn't happen in 2020, and the 2022 champion, right? Like this conference produces national champions year in, year out, or certainly competes for it every year before that as well, right? Houston moves into that conference on top of losing those three starters. Then along the way, you have three season-ending injuries to uh, to Terrence Arsenault, right? A key, like six-man, first guy off the bench, future NBA player. Trust me on that one, future NBA player, right? After the season, 20 killings. You got Ramon Walker's injury, right? Ramon Walker's knee injury happened in practice just like less than 48 hours before having to go play at Baylor in Waco, right? Suffered that injury. JoJo Tugler dumped the season with a foot injury, right? He was your entire bench forward part. Like he was your only forward coming in off the bench, right? At that time, he goes down the season ending foot injury. Okay. That's three guys in rotation suffering season ending injuries. J1 Roberts having his knee drained every couple weeks, having stitches in his hand, and now throwing a shin injury into the whole deal. Right. You've got the time that uh, Javier Francis falls on his hip and misses the entire Kansas game. You got different guys putting the heating pads in their back from hitting the ground as well. And somehow, the number one team in America continues to win. Now, Jamal Shedd is a big part of that. I don't mean to make light of him. And Kelvin Sampson is a big part of that. I don't mean to make like it all one or the other. But this program is at a high point. I'm telling, like, 30 win seasons don't just happen. And with different lineups, different kids, different conferences, different obstacles every single year, this team has continued to hit that 30 win mark. Now, I know there's no national championship to put on top of it, right? And I know that there's one Final Four and Elite Eight and the Sweet 16 and stuff like that to kind of all encompass in this run here that they've got. And there are people that'll be like, well, they should have a lot more. There, there are going to be naysayers and critics out there that say a lot of other things. 30 wins in a row with the hurdles this team continues to jump over to get there is incredibly impressive. And I know that there's a conference championship game to win on Saturday night. And I know there's a March Madness tournament starting this week to get ready for. But I want to take a moment to appreciate that. And I think that it's important that people do take a moment to appreciate that, that that is so incredibly difficult for any program to do, frankly, for what it's worth, before Kelvin Sampson got to Houston, they had not had a 31 season since Faisley and Majama. And before Faisley and Majama, it had been since uh, Elvin Hayes. Right? Like These things mark, 31 seasons mark, the highlights of entire programs. A historic program like Houston has only had these spurts of times where this thing happens. Right? It's incredibly impressive. And that they did it this year with all the obstacles in their way and everything against them along the way continues to be absolutely insane, right? They're doing with anyone who puts on a Houston Cougar uniform, right? As Coach said, 19-year-old said lot just started playing basketball at 15. He's out there playing 10 minutes in the Big 12 semifinals. Uh, doesn't matter if the Houston Cougars put the jersey on They've got a shot, and they continue, continue, continue to do it. That's why I'm picking them against Iowa State. Um, now, I'm picking them all the way. I, I I don't know why anyone would pick against this team as the Big 12 champions. If you think I'm crazy, you think I'm going too fast, if you think I'm pausing to reflect too early, or if you want to just celebrate with me, tell me in the comments down below. Locked on Cougs is the primary Locked on Pocket. I mean, it's your team, our Cougs, every day. Go Cougs.